Uh, for this morning, um, as we uh, prepare our hearts just to hear the last word from, from Dr. Blackaby, um, I want to invite you um, to, to join me in thinking back to some of God's promises that have been impactful for you. If there was a verse or um, uh, a, 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 a part of scripture that was uh, that was encouraging to you in, in, a, in a hard place or a challenging place, uh, I invite you just to think about that now because um, I'll pray, And but I want us to be, see if we can just take a chance just to share that. And so, um, so, what I want to do is I have a I have a got one of God's promises listed here as well from the Psalms. I want to read it out, and then if you're willing, just to look up a verse um, that you that was again um, encouraging or or helpful to you, one of God's promises, and just to come up and just read out that verse and just proclaim His word out for for all of us. Um, and so we'll just take a, a few minutes for that, and then we'll go into um, into to a song that we can reflect, but. Yeah, I just want to invite you because I think it's just another way that we can worship God. Um, during COVID, we haven't been able to worship um, Him as we normally would. We haven't been able to gather. We haven't been able to sing the songs that we love and are are so um, impactful for us. But we can still proclaim His name, and thus that uh, that command and that directive to worship Him with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind hasn't hasn't gone away, or to and to love Him. Rather, so allow me to pray, and then we'll and we'll we'll do that together. Heavenly Father, we come before you, um, yeah, with just thanksgiving and excitement in our hearts for what you are doing here at this school, Father, in this community, um, and also just here in uh, in Alberta, Canada. We thank you for how you are so steadfast in in your promises. And as we just take this moment to reflect on those promises, Father. I pray uh, that we would not forget them, that we would cling on to them and hold them tightly to our hearts and uh, be able to share your love with others around us. So help us to have those open eyes um, and willing hearts for that, Father. In your name I pray, amen. Uh, so the uh, so the verse that I have here as a promise uh, is from Psalm 146, and it says, Happy is the one whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord, his God, the maker of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them. He remains faithful, executing justice for the exploited and giving food to the hungry. So the verse that I thought about comes from Isaiah chapter 40 uh, and uh, from verses 28 to 31. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God the creator of the whole earth. He never becomes faint or weary. There is no limit to his understanding. He gives strength to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Youths may become faint and weary and young men stumble and fall, but those who trust in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles they will run and not become weary. They will walk and not faint. This is the verse that precedes Dr. Booth. <laughs> this, this is the one that sets you searching for the ones that he just read to you. Psalm 55, verse 17. In the evening and in the morning and at noon, I will complain to God. That's not the most amazing part. The most amazing part is the next phrase, and God will hear me. Amen. I'm afraid I don't have a Bible in front of me, but I'm thinking of Psalm 139, and it's about verse 18. It ties a little bit in with what Dr. Don was saying. It says, How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. And that is how much the Lord thinks of us and has us on his mind. A couple of verses of context, two commands and a promise. In Psalm 46, come behold the works of the Lord. who has wrought desolations on the earth. He makes wars to cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow. And he cuts the spear in two. He burns the chariots with fire. Another command. Cease striving. 
and know that I am God. Now the promise. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. These are from Philippians 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Be anxious for nothing, but with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds in Jesus Christ. A paraphrase, a Philip's paraphrase. All right, well, thank you. Um, uh, to, to those who shared and uh, I, there's lots of open Bibles here in the room. So uh, thank you for just participating and allowing God's promises just to for you to be reminded of that this morning. We're going to watch a, a, just another video. And this one is one that um, was put together by a, a community, the Sharpen community of uh, which is worship leaders and then church uh, church members from churches across uh, Calgary and greater Calgary area. Um, I appreciated what uh, Dr. Watson said yesterday about allowing th this to be a time of create of creativity and imagination. And for sure, while we have some things taken away, there's been some excellent um, collaborations and projects that have been uh, so creatively done and encouraging to others. And so this was one of them. The, the song is King of Kings, and it's proclaims God for who he is, uh, according to how the scripture portrays him. And it's just it's such a powerful, powerful thing to see um, leaders from, from churches across Calgary um, proclaiming him uh, in, in voice and song together. Uh, and this was a video that was put together for Pentecost Sunday. And uh, I thought it'd be appropriate now just as we um, close out Spiritual Emphasis Week. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the wise from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Praise 
and the dead rose from their tombs, and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the Father are restored. And the church of Christ was born. Then the Spirit lit the flame. Now this gospel truth of all shall not be, shall not fade. By His blood and in His name, in His freedom I am free. For the love of Jesus Christ, who has resurrected me. just so you th don't think that uh, David was self-indulgent in playing that. I, I requested yesterday that he play that before I speak. Uh, one of the reasons for me is this. Uh, it's easy to think that I'm the only one going through this the way that it's unfolding. And This week we've been talking a lot actually about a, as, us as a community, but David not only representing our school, but also the church where he was on leadership uh, with worship. It, the, Matter of fact, the leader from the booth and our home church, um, Rachel, was involved in that video. There are Christian leaders, you know, across Calgary saying, we are in this together. Um, and there's power there. Um, when this is all said and done, for me personally, uh, I will say it has been good to be here this week. Um, There's, a, there's an intentionality with saying, with Christ amidst crises, not just crisis. Uh, there's a reason why it's plural, because right now we're facing a crisis, but it's not alone. It's not the only time we're going to face crisis in our life. And actually, I think during COVID, <clears throat> the crises are layered on each other, and sometimes there's a cumulative effect uh, that we feel. And certainly for me this week, I've realized some of the weight that I have been internally and God been calling on me to put it down to, to rest in Him. And maybe you felt the same effect. So this is our last chapel for the week with Christ of Crises, lessons learned since last spring. I'll give you a spoiler alert. We'll be looking at Luke chapter 22 if you want to turn to that or put up on your device. Um, Luke chapter 22, verses 31 and 32, that was the first passage I ever done in my life. So it's a while ago. Since, since that time, and because as part of uh, preaching through this passage, I had memorized these verses. Every time I get, or I'm reading through the book of Luke, and I get to this particular passage, I pause in a, a significant way. It takes me back. How many years would that be? Almost 35 years, maybe more, to the place where I was an older teen standing in front of a church, mentored by a godly pastor named Pastor Rod Wilkinson, who recently went to be with the Lord. 
And this, that was uh, absolutely the case during COVID as I was reading through this passage and it struck me in a familiar way and in some new ways. And I want to share out of this passage this morning. I think there's some paradoxes that we've walked through during this COVID era. Uh, and let me lay some of them out for you. It's been a time of anxiety. And many of us have felt it. I, I'm not bold enough to say we've all felt it. But many of us have felt it. Um, you know, as recently as this morning, I know that my youngest has got to go get a COVID test because he's, he's tripping almost every single symptom. And I'd lie to you if I didn't say there's a part of my father's heart that's millions, not hundreds of thousands, millions of people have walked through this. It's a time of anxiety, but it's also a time of unique opportunity for us. And Dr. Booth spoke so powerfully to this. This is not a, a open-ended opportunity. The, the, the window will close on this opportunity in my life, but also this is an opportunity of ministry in other people's lives. So yes, it's a time of anxiety, but it's also a time of opportunity. It's a time where things slow down. I know that they're starting to open up, but I'm telling you, driving from the, the campus back to my residence in Southeast Calgary, that drive is still very different than it would normally be. Not so many cars on the road, not so much rush hour, even in, in the midst of 5.30, 6 o'clock Calgary traffic, you, things have slowed down. So, and, and for a while, they just stopped. And I don't know about you, but when I hear on the news that the government's talking about possibly we don't want to, but we might have to do another shutdown, it's, everything in me says, I don't want that. I don't want to shut down again. And yet, while we're shut down, everything seems to be changing. And I was just talking early this morning with my sister in Vancouver and, and about how things are so similar. And yet in the midst of familiarity, it's, it's just off. You know? So it's static and yet at the same time changing. One that's powerful for me this morning is um, things can be or feel very uncertain. And yet it can be a time of, of clarity. In the early 2000s, Andy Stanley wrote an article for Christianity Today called The Uncertain Leader. And in that he says, uncertainty is, is not an indication of poor leadership. It uncovers the need for leadership. It's the environment in which good leadership is most easily identified. You can't always be sure, but you better be clear. That's a powerful statement. In the early weeks of COVID, I was reading, uh, and I've mentioned it before, but I was reading the book by Todd Bolsinger, Canoeing the Mountains. I commend it to you. I think you ought to read it. It was written in 2015. I'll actually reference it later this morning. Uh, but it was written in 2015 for such a time as this. There's another article that was written. Uh, many things obviously were written, but this one hit me hard by Praxis, the organization Praxis. And the article simply just, you can, you can Google it, leading beyond the blizzard, why every organization is now a startup. And he was specifically targeting, or they were specifically targeting churches and institutions like ours. What is the cumulative effect of COVID as we plan for the future? Well, I'm thinking about these things, obviously, as I come to Luke 22. I'm going to read a larger section of scripture so that I can thoroughly embed verses 31 and 32, sorry, uh, yeah, 31 and 32 in their context. But I want to start reading actually in, in verse 14. So we, we now know that there is a, a firm plot afoot to have Jesus killed. His enemies are raging. His disciples, as we're going to see again in this passage, are disoriented. Um, they're not understanding uh, what's happening. They misunderstand their own stability or they, 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 mis they certainly misunderstand the predictability of the days to come. And they certainly misunderstand their capacity to withstand the tempest that they're about to walk through. Um, and so there's this plot afoot. 
And Jesus is trying to gather his disciples together for we, what we now call the Lord's Supper. We continually celebrate it together as God's people. And it's right before he heads to the garden and is arrested and will be crucified in short order. That's where we find this passage. When the hour came, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have fervently desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I'll not eat again. I will not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I tell you, from now on, I'll not drink of the fruit of this vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper and said, This is the new covenant established by my blood. It is shed for you. But look, the hand of the one betraying me is at the table with me. For the Son of Man will go away as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. So they began to argue among themselves which of them it could be who was going to do this thing. Then a dispute a moment rose among them about who should be considered the greatest. But he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles dominate them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it must not be like that among you. On the contrary, whoever is greatest among you must become like the youngest, and whoever leads like the one serving. For who's greater, the one at the table or the one serving? Isn't it the one at the table? But I'm among you as the one who serves. You are the ones who stood by me in my trials. I bestow on you a kingdom just as my father bestowed one on me, so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. And you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Simon, Simon, look out. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Lord, he told them, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. I tell you, Peter, he said, the rooster will not crow today until you deny three times that you know me. Clarity? Well, the first thing I want to observe is um, Jesus is quite specific that a sifting is going to take place. If I understand the language right, he's addressing all of them. Satan's asked and he has received permission to sift every one of you. He hasn't just asked for Judas. He wants all of you. Did you see that? The hand of the one who's going to betray me is at the table. But Satan has asked and received permission to test all of you. Jesus says to the disciples, listen, it's not just Judas that Satan wanted. He demanded to have you all, and he has obtained permission to sift you like wheat. Like with everything else, Satan desi Satan's desire is to use this season for utter and total destruction of God's people. The winnowing process, as far as I understand it, is a vigorous process where you take the, the wheat, let's say, and in shaking it and throwing it up in the wind and then shaking it and throwing it up in the wind, the goal is to remove the chaff and be left with the pure kernels that you're actually ultimately going to use to bake. To, to me, that's a violent process. It's a tormenting process. If you were a kernel of wheat, I suspect that you would possibly resent the farmer for doing this to you. 
If you were the kernel of wheat, I suspect that you might suddenly say, stop it. And the farmer would say, you, you don't understand. There's more chaff for me to get out. Who am I to guess? But it would seem to me based on the request that is granted by God himself that Satan actually wants to prove the disciples to be chaff when Jesus knows they're weak. He's not just trying to do it. There is an uncanny parallel, it seems to me, in this passage and the book of Job, where once again you have a tormentor saying, I want permission to see if I can't prove your servant to be unrighteous, unfaithful, unworthy. He wants to put us to the test. He wants to put our righteousness to the test. And he wants to see us fail. Satan's under God's authority. He could not sift until he had God's permission to do so. So whatever sifting is coming, it is only by divine permission. You could read this and say, oh yes, but that was Simon. But sometimes Satan gets to act rogue and I think he is going unchecked in my life. And I would say that is actually inaccurate. If God is allowing a winnowing process in our lives, there is an end that he's after. And he's been after it during the COVID crisis. He's after deeper stuff than just our protection. He's after character. If you've come to this school, it's because God has desired to so thoroughly interrupt and reshape and orient your character that you would be ready for an assignment that he's about to give you for his own kingdom's sake. Even in the middle of COVID, he has been building, shaping, and refining our characters. And, and I, I take seriously the, the comfort that Paul gives the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, beginning in verse 12. So he says, so whoever thinks he stands, you have to be careful not to fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to humanity. God is faithful. He'll not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. But with the temptation, he'll also provide a way of escape so that you are able to bear it. Now, I believe, let me just say as a, as a disclaimer, I believe he's talking to those who are walking with Christ. I don't think he's talking to those who are rebellious and running like worldlings wild. He's talking to those who are following Christ and saying, God knows what he's doing and he knows the design that he has. And Satan has to ask permission before any sifting can take place in your life. Am I overstating it? I don't think so. Well, I need to move on because <clears throat> the promise, the reason I didn't come to the mic is because I was going to speak this morning on, on this promise right here. Verse 32. In the middle of every, inter every sifting, there is intervention going on. What does it mean for Jesus to pray for you? I don't have time to go there this morning, uh, but I would encourage you to read John, John chapter 17 and see the heart of our Savior poured out for you. Specifically, particularly verses 9 to 10 and verse 20. What does it mean for Jesus to pray for me? Hebrews 7.25 says, He's always able to save those who come to God through him since he always lives to intercede for them. Romans chapter 8.34 says, Christ Jesus is the one who died, but even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. What does it mean that Jesus would pray for you? You, you mean that he has been interceding for me 
in the last six months during COVID? That's precisely what I mean. You are not alone. You might have felt sorely sifted and hard pressed, but you're not alone. Not only does the church of Jesus Christ pray for you, as we've witnessed just moments ago, but your Savior himself intercedes for you. Wow. One of my spiritual heroes is Robert Murray McChaney, and this is what he wrote. He died early from disease, 29. God used him mightily in the great revivals that were sweeping the great British Isles. If I could hear Christ praying for me in the next room, I would, I would not fear a million enemies. Yet the distance makes no difference. He is praying for me. Do you need to hear that this morning? Do you need to know that God himself has a mind toward you? One commentator, Michael Wilcox, said, when the son prays to the father, a power is released which checks all Satan's demands. And this word pray, so different than the word used for what Satan is up to. He's demanding permission. That's not, that's not even close to what Jesus is doing. He is praying for you. The word has at its root the thought of binding. He has asked for us. He has committed himself for us as our bondmen, as our security. He didn't ask that his servant would be freed from trouble. He prayed that his faith wouldn't fail. Did you notice that? Jesus knows our peril and he intercedes. And he restores. He restores. Maybe there was um, a night when the weightiness of COVID was just crushing or debilitating and afterwards you just thought oh god how could i how could i wonder how could i doubt jesus says i i can restore you see i've prayed for you and i can restore you in a sense it may, maybe explicitly he's saying when you when you retrace your steps when you come back to me strengthen others too Use the dark nights of your soul to encourage others. Celebrate restoration in your life and then serve that up to others in Christ's name. Another commentator, Leon Morris, said, He who has been through deep waters has the experience that enables him to be of help to others. Isn't that good? This journey isn't just for you, and it's not just for me. It's so that God could work through us to bring others into his kingdom as well. That we could say to somebody with all integrity, I understand what you're going through. Because see, I've gone through that too. And having been restored by Christ, I can tell you, he has the power to restore you and to bring you hope. Strengthen your brothers. What would that look like? Well, here I just want to read a few lessons that I have learned through the past few months. The big picture is this. It's not new. Strengthen your brothers. Yeah, what I mean, maybe the biggest picture is that we're constantly, constantly reorienting people, moving them onto God's agenda. Saying this is not... Your eyes are, are fixed on the wrong place. This is where your eyes ought to be fixed. This is where God's moving. This is where God's at work. In some more specific areas, I would say, um, what does it mean to strengthen? Well, it, it means that you've got to lead out of the overflow of your personal intimacy with God. The growth that God's accomplished in your life isn't just for you. His body, the church, needs it from you. I've asked you before, especially at the beginning of this week, what am I doing with any extra hours that I have in my day? I'm not a, I'm not a, uh, against people, you know, watching a television show or watching a movie. I'm, I'm not raging against that. What I am saying is, could we capture some of those spare moments and force them into service to Christ and saying, I haven't read 
this particular book of Scripture in I don't know how long and just get in it. For me personally, there have been some real bright spots. I was tempted actually this morning to preach out of the book of Ruth because I got to spend some precious time in there amongst other books this this during the last six months. Leading out of the overflow of your intimacy with God, like God had you reading in a specific area of Scripture, like I said on Tuesday. He had you reading there for a reason. Lean into that and say, God, why did you have me reading here? What is it that I'm supposed to see? Because I'm encountering the God of the Bible in this very moment. Write it down. Don't think that your, your memory is long enough that you'll remember it. Uh, I, was, I was given a lesson again this week because I was cleaning out some old file cabinets in my office and I, found, I found a, actually found a prayer journal from the, the, the months right around when my wife and I moved to Calgary to Pastor Trinity Baptist Church in 1995. And I'm just reading my prayers to the Lord. I would have a scripture and then a responsive prayer. And I'm reading through those prayers. And I was thinking, oh my, how did I forget that? It was such a powerful time. Write it down. You're going to need it. The God of the universe has interrupted your life and taught you something. I, I'm not going to belabor every one of these specifics. But I'm belaboring this one because the best ministry in our lives is out of the overflow of our intimacy with Christ. Another specific is avoiding the crippling pressure of the urgent, which so often eclipses important things in our life. Now, you, you could talk to Dr. Booth and I. Um, in the early weeks, there was a lot of urgent, wasn't there? Like, well, maybe months. And, and, and so sometimes life is that way, where it's like every day, <laughs> here's not just another problem. Here's another dozen problems that you've got to wrestle to the ground. But eventually, you've got to get your head up and start thinking about not just the urgent things, but the important things and how those have to be adjusted to as well. I guess the word I'd use here is being intentional. Beware of a prolonged reactive posture and adopt a proactive posture. Sometimes we can't help it. Things happen and we have to respond. We didn't see them coming. Certainly, Peter might have been this way. But Jesus is saying, in a sense, to Peter, I've prayed for you that when your faith has failed and you are restored, now be proactive and strengthen the brothers. Another specific, personal, personal rhythms of your life. Um, I hope that the changes we've experienced that are God-breathed, well, we will keep those as part of our routine the rest of our life these rhythms. Your character, your care, the constancy in you. These, these are, these are, this is where competency is proven in us. Well, how about clarity? As I said at the beginning of the sermon, this is a season for refining and reflecting. You'll have to adapt. You'll have to adventure with Christ. And the last uh, specific for me is unction. It feels to me like that for the last six months, it's not been about skill or acquiring new skill, although that has been very important. It hasn't been about communication whether it's written or verbal, although that has been very important. Do you know what it's been about? The palpable presence of God and his power at work. That's what it's been about. Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones was writing about unction. and He says, unction is God giving power and enabling through the spirit to work in order to, that he may do his work in a manner that lifts up beyond the efforts and endeavors of man to a position in which the preacher is being used by the Spirit and becomes the channel through whom the Spirit works. Unction. Bolsinger says on page 42 of his book, leadership is energizing a community of people toward their own transformation in order to accomplish a shared mission in the face of a changing world. 
Have you felt sifted over the last six months? During the sifting, have you reached a place where you have said, God, I have failed you? Our Savior was, is, and will intercede for you. He has authority and is fully capable of restoring you. But it doesn't end there. And then moving you into an intentional place of influence to strengthen the church of Jesus Christ. With Christ amidst crisis. I pray that you'd be able to say my experience of COVID doesn't resemble the world at all. Because Christ was with me in the room. And he will be with me still. As you go through the semester, the question for me would be, so as Christ restores you again and again and again, where does he want you to engage his people? What is it that he wants you to do to strengthen his people based on the experience that he's just walked you through? Obviously, I don't know what tomorrow brings. I would like to think we'll continue to eke our way up out of this COVID massive disruption and abnormality, but I don't know. You don't know. I don't know what Christmas will look like. I don't know if further restrictions will come. I don't know that they'll find a cure. I don't know. But I do know this, the Jesus that we serve, who's Lord of this school and Lord of your life, intercedes for you and has the authority to restore you and use you to strengthen his church. One of the songs that was really meaningful to me, uh, April, really, April-ish, was a song that was written actually not long before the, the pandemic hit. Uh, I don't think that the, the, the writers of this song, uh, composers of the song, could possibly have known. There's no way they could possibly have known that it would become a global anthem of the church and it started um, in, well, I'm not sure where it started. I, I know that the first time I saw it was the Blessing UK. And shortly after, Christian leaders from across Canada, through Zoom, posted the Blessing Canada. And then the Blessing Australia, and then the Blessing Fiji, and the Blessing dot, dot, dot. The Blessing Canada, I cannot tell you how many times I've listened to that. Daily, multiple times a day, for weeks. There was something powerful about Christian leaders in our nation standing as one, proclaiming a blessing over the church of Jesus Christ. Satan, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked and received permission to sift you like wheat. When you retrace your steps and you come back to me, I have interceded for you. And my intercession means that there is a return open. And when you have been restored, strengthen your brothers. I want to end a little different today by listening to the blessing. And uh, allow this to be the voice of a choir from across Canada singing a blessing over your life as we dismiss Face 
shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen, amen, Children and the children and the children, may his presence go before. 
Simon, Simon, behold. Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And you, when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Amen.